You're listening to the Hour of History podcast with your hosts Stephen Bauman and Matthias Fueling and producer James Abel. The Hour of History podcast aims to understand how we know what we know and why the past matters. Without further delay, your Hour of History begins right now. Hello, welcome to Hour of History podcast. I'm uh, Stephen Bauman and I'm with uh, Matthias Fueling. Uh, the dynamic duo is back. We're back and we're here to talk about a serious topic. A very serious topic. If you've been following the news, you might have seen that Poland has just passed a new law. Yeah, that's, uh, it's pretty interesting when Poland makes the news anyway, because yeah. Poland's not one of those nations that's always there, but uh, they've been in the news the last couple weeks, and the law was just signed in. It was a law that was about the Holocaust. But you, you, you said the details of the law. Yeah, so, so <laughs> I, I might get I might get a little mistaken. Yeah, so um, so the idea of this Polish law is that Poles cannot be accused of committing crimes against the Nazis or uh, sorry against Jews during the Holocaust. Instead, you have to be honest and say it was the Nazis that committed the crimes. This is what the Polish law yeah, says. Yeah, the they, honest truth is that it was Nazis killing Jews. Yeah, so it's it's almost sort of like saying that it's slanderous against the Polish nation. Mm -hmm. If you claim, it's almost like it's, it's almost as if it would be a hate crime against Poland and Poles for you as a Polish citizen to say that Poles were responsible in any capacity or took part in the Holocaust. And the penalty is a potential three years yeah, in prison. Yeah, it's pretty intense. And so it's a very censorious law. Um, and yet, unsurprisingly, Israel is very upset about this. Um, is Israel, like, I know they've, like, officially done a condemnation against right. the law. So did the United States. Rex Tillerson very strongly denounced it. I don't know if there's going to be any, like, sanctiony, actual real political fallout other than just sort of, like, Ooh, Poland, not EU, but it definitely is making some strain in Europe between um, Poland and some of its neighbors, and definitely um, with Israel and the United States. And uh, the, and Israel has even talked about putting in a law of their own, saying that anyone who does not own up to the Holocaust is not going to be welcome in Israel. So <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, dueling dueling Holocaust laws. Um, but the real question you might be is like, why is this so contentious? Why is it that you know seventy? How many years now from the end of World War II? Is it 70-something years? Almost 80. 80 years. Why is it? Why are we still passing laws about the interpretation or about the discussion of an historical event? Well, Matthias, that sounds like an important question for historians to tackle. <laughs> In fact, I, I was just wondering myself, when does history begin? When, when can they say, you know, this was not Polish people doing this. It was something else. I don't know. I mean... And in many ways, it's, it's interesting how certain events become so politicized and some don't. Mm -hmm. um, but it probably of all of the modern uh, major historical events, the Holocaust is perhaps the most political and the most politicized. But so it requires, I think, for us to start talking about, like, why is, is anyone really concerned with Poland and the Holocaust? Why is it such a big contentious deal there in Poland and in Israel? Mm-hmm. You, and and that's another thing. When you're ever you're analyzing a historical issue, you can start. You can go way back and draw it forward, or you can start in the present and sort of look uh, backwards. Oh, why is that important? Yeah. And with Poland, I think it's interesting if we start a little more recent, um, and and kind of establish what Poland is today, just in the last twenty years, and then maybe we can look back towards the Holocaust. Um, okay. Well, so Poland, right? It was under Soviet occupation. Well. Soviet occupation mm -hmm. <laughs> with like finger quotes, um, right? It was part of the Eastern Bloc, part of the Warsaw Pact. It was basically, you know, sort of a client state of the Soviet Union um, since the end of World War II. Um, it actually got new boundaries after World War II. It took in a lot of territory that was at the time considered Prussia. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a fairly, we would think of new nation. Poland, as we understand it, did not come into being until after World War I. Um, so it's a very uh, already politically charged nation. Um, geographically large. Geographically very large. Um, it's six basically right now, right square between Russia and Germany. Um, and so it has a very contentious history. And it basically it has sort of the noble or sort of the usual kind of modern narrative I think about Poland is it had sort of a noble dissident movement, which was a Solidarnosc or Solidarity the sort of a workers' union movement that arose in the early 1980s under the influence and leadership of a worker by the name of Lech Walesa. 
um, in Gdansk, in the, on the north coast uh, in Poland. And who, who actually, like, he's become a mainstay in United States history textbooks. You know, his yeah. picture is always he's considered. There. Yeah, so he's... So Poland has what we think is like kind of a standard heroic mm. Disney narrative, narrative yeah. that that it was under you know the control of the evil Soviets. There was the Solidarity Movement that rose up against it, led by this nice guy Lech Walesa. It got oppressed, but it came back. And then in the eighties, right, the Berlin Wall falls, Soviet Union collapses, and the idea then is that you know Poland moves into a bright, new, wonderful democratic future. And and the the way Poland is portrayed in the media and everything is is always in that sort of role, like. Look at the sort of development Poland's done. They've they've made Warsaw and Krakow into these beautiful tourist destinations that attract people from all over the world. They had some very good press with Pope John Paul II. That's true. That's true. Pope John Paul II was a Polish was a Polish citizen, um, born in Poland, um, and inspired you know a heavily Catholic country. Yeah, Poland is very deeply Catholic. And and, and his Catholicism played a major role in sort of the dissident movement, right? And it, and it always contributed to this sort of uh, good press that Poland kind of has in the West yeah. as like a friendly Eastern European country. Yeah. But the but the story, once you dig deeper, is a little bit more contentious and perhaps not as neat as we would like it to be. Sounds like um, history. Sounds a little bit like history. <laughs> so if you're coming at this from probably a more liberally democratic perspective, um, Poland is looking very. Um, uneasy right now. It's going through a major um, sort of, as as is a lot of places around the world, it's going through a major right-wing kind of revival. Mm -hmm. um, the government is under the control of very right-wing parties. Uh, the political rhetoric is getting very right-wing, very nationalistic. Um, a lot of laws are being proposed that would shut down a lot of civil liberties, that would inculcate a lot of sort of a sense of like we belong as a Catholic pure nation. Um, Lech Walesa, <laughs> to not necessarily everyone's surprise, turns out to be actually a very hardcore Polish nationalist, um, very much Islamophobic, very pro-Catholic, but not just that, but also very anti-abortion. Right. Um, and right. Very, 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 we might think of very hard right-wing conservative social views that have come to the fore in modern Poland and particularly in the last few years in Poland. And also, and not just, and again, the way Poland's viewed from abroad, because of this sort of movement, right, and they'll have, uh, there was a massive fascist march. Well, but I'll, but let's, okay, let's but, get ahead but, of ourselves. But because of, <laughs> just because of this, they're getting, they've, or they've had, at least in the last 10 years, a reputation, and this goes, this goes through beyond politics, even in soccer, uh, Legia Warsaw was uh, basically kicked out of the Champions League a year ago because of the fans the demonstrations that were done by the fans within the stadium so whenever they're playing teams from continental europe um those kind of things come into effect so so poland's it's it's reputation is is sort of uh changing it's a getting little a little darker and so on that note of of the of the rally so what was it like two months ago three months mm -hmm. ago there was a major um nationals rally and some of the narratives are like it's all neo-nazis marching some of it is it's a oh there's a handful of like these really nasty neo-nazi types amongst the big nationalist rally but suffice it to say there's tens of thousands of people march through the streets of warsaw it's very 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 nationalistic very much the idea you know that poland is sort of this deep you know almost you know special nation with a special destiny and they don't want to take in any immigrants and they want to impose a certain kind of you know conservative values Obviously, there are some very nasty right-wing types mixed in with that. Um, I tried to be charitable towards the Poles. I study Polish history a little bit, so I don't want to be like all anti-Polish. But it definitely did not look good. Um, lots of lots of um, Roman Nazi salutes were thrown. Lots of anti-Islamic um, rhetoric was fl flown. It looked very nasty. It did not sound nice at all. Also, what was it last year? Donald Trump gave his hyper, like what, like sort of... You know, defense of the West speech in Poland, right. where um, the Polish like ruling party bust in supporters to like you know make Trump look good. And he was he was actually paraphrasing Pope John Paul II. Yeah, yeah. And so so the question though is so Poland's going through all of this, but then it's not surprising then that they would pass a law regarding the Holocaust. And and one of the impetus, one of the things that started this whole discussion in Poland at least was in 2012 um, President Barack Obama was in Poland giving a speech and in the speech he made a reference to a Polish death camp uh, referring to the Holocaust. Yeah. And uh, um, 
he apologized for it, and and the presidential medal was actually awarded to a member of the resistance. Like this was a, a pro Poland speech yeah. for sure. But the thing, uh, the mention of these words together, Polish death camp, that was enough to make. And Poland, rightly so. That's a loaded sort of term. It's a very loaded term. But this also then gets back to the politics of the legacy of the Holocaust. So, no surprise, Auschwitz is um, is on Polish soil, but not just Auschwitz. Um, many death camps um, and concentration camps were located in Poland. Um, in fact, I think the, um, more than any other country in occupied Europe during World War II, uh, Poland had the most of the camps. Which means to say that most of the industrialized killing that occurred during the Holocaust occurred on Polish soil. Um, essentially, the entire population of Polish Jews was wiped out. Um, and th this also deals with how sort of both the timing of when Poland was uh, occupied by the Nazis and also by the uh, way the Nazis viewed Poles yeah. versus German Jews. So, so yeah. But let's go back. So let's take a step to kind of build up the long narrative of Polish history. So we kind of know there's some troublesome relationship right now in Poland and kind of conservative right-wing forces, tumultuous relationship between Poles and the Holocaust. So Poland, as I said earlier, did not really become a nation until right after World War I. Um, Poland for a long time was part of what we, what's now called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This is like really old school, ancient European history. Right. But essentially um, for quite a few decades or centuries, there was kind of this weird kingdom slash empire that was located in Eastern Europe that roughly encompasses what's now like Belarus, the Baltics, Poland, parts of Slovakia, um, Ukraine, a big massive area that was considered part of um, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It was this kind of warlordy feudal society ruled by various landlords um, and nobles who considered themselves to have a distinctive identity. Um, it was sort of a combo of both Lithuania and Poland. It's a very kind of tumultuous history until it gets broken up by various political forces. Russian, the Russian Empire expands, it bites off big chunks of this territory. Um, the Hungarian Empire, you know, the Hungarians and the Ottoman um, and, the, and the Habsburg Empire expand. The Germans start to move in. And slowly, step by step, um, Pol this Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth gets swallowed up by other empires. So starting in the 1700s, Poles don't have what we think of as an independent state. They are ruled by about three or four other empires. And this leads into the 19th century to a very intense Polish nationalism. Poles who are educated, they start to think of themselves as what they call the Christ of nations. They feel that they're sort of been persecuted by all these empires. They look back to the glory days when they had this giant empire that ruled Eastern Europe. Um, they all are by, they all know multiple languages, right? Because they're being you know raised and educated under these different empires, but they have a common sense of identity as Poles that they start to develop. Um, there's actually numerous uprisings in what's now today or what would have been um, Eastern Poland against the Russians, right? There's lots of uprisings, lots of Poles get deported to Siberia under the old Russian Empire. It's a very intense thing. So after World War I and, you know, the breakup of, of the German Empire and the breakup of the Habsburg Empire and the weakening of the Russian Empire with the Russian Revolution, Polish nationalists take this opportunity, right, with the rise of, of the Versailles Treaty and Woodrow Wilson and sort of the self-determinative nations, they decide to found a new independent Polish state. And one of the things when countries are starting to build states, especially after World War I, you really see the mechanics of nationalism turning. And nationalism, you know, was something that through the 19th century, people had learned a lot from. So as we're entering the first years of the 20th century, people know how to build nations. And the things they build nations around are common uh, cultural things like Catholicism in the case of Poland. And one of the things Catholicism had been um, struggling with Christianity since the time of Jesus was relationship with Jews. And when Poland is established, um, they do what pretty much all of Europe did at the beginning of the 20th century, and they make laws that sort of exclude Jews from um, public sector jobs, exclude yeah. Jews from holding, living in certain areas, from, yeah. from being treated basically like that Catholic Polish identity, that the Pole is different yeah. than the Polish Jew. Yeah, and that's a major part of all European nationalism in the 19th century, but particularly Polish nationalism is anti-Semitism. 
Um, right? So the mythology with this Polish nationalism is that we Poles are a noble, suffering people. We know we now live under the yoke of these different empires. And a lot of this gets coded onto being also ruled by Jews. Um, and this is... And th- and, and the interesting thing, this happens in, in Germany, too, is, is the Jews are never a big part of the population. You know, 10% maybe in Poland and, and not much more elsewhere, but they are, they are always sort of the fault. They're at yeah, home. and so it, it's a mixture of traditional just Christian anti-Semitism, right? The Jews killed Jesus. A lot of that then is also coded into really nasty kind of xenoph- like natural xenophobia. Jews are the most visible minority throughout all of European history. Um, it also gets coded for particular reasons, though, with economics, because for, right, because Jews for centuries are given, they're, they're not allowed to take part, they're, they're like, they're not allowed to take part in many professions, right? Yeah. There's lots of laws passed throughout Europe through the centuries that, you know, Jews can only live here, right? Which leads to the rise of the phenomenon of the ghetto, like the Jewish quarter of major cities. Jews are not allowed to own property or land, so they can't farm. They can't become independent that way. Really, they have to be the middleman. That's yeah. like the only thing yeah. they can do. Yeah, and so do. Jews also, right, so for various reasons, they're excluded from almost every walk of life. Yeah. And however, according to religious laws, right, against the so-called, you know, um, ban on usury within Christianity, um, you know, your Christians are not supposed to lend money. Um, and then, of course, as European as European empires start to expand, though, they start to build capital, all of a sudden finance becomes important. And Jews, of course, are excluded from virtually every other thing. So they inevitably become, or not necessarily inevitably, but very easily and naturally, they become sort of the financial middlemen who can do, they can lend, they can, you know. And also another important thing is that Jews, as a, as a minority within Europe at this time, far superior to any other European groups are literate. They can read and write. And this is also because in Judaism, it's in, it's it's like incumbent on you as a Jew to know how to read and write so you can read the Torah, right? They so you can call read. on the people of the book for yeah, a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like, because the idea is like, you have your sacred text and it's upon you as a Jew to be true to God. You need to know how to read the Bible. And also if you want to copy it, and also there's a huge right emphasis on learning within Judaism and also right because they're a minority diasporic people. The only way they can sort of keep their tradition and their people alive essentially is through knowledge of the past, knowledge of their religion, which inevitably also leads to, you know, literacy and writing. Mm -hmm. So when you start to see the burgeoning of basically a capitalist global system, Jews are very well placed to be right in the middle because they can read and write they're excluded from virtually any other um, um, job or prospects, and so they very naturally become financial middlemen. And there's also so this yeah you know this is just the economic and the political side. There's also the so this is like this is like the thirty thousand foot view of history. Right. It's very brief, very more complicated. brief, and yeah, it's much more complicated. Different types of Judaism, so on and so forth. But this is sort of the basic what you points, need to know. Yeah. And there's also this growing um, idea, you know, tied in deeply with empire colonialism, is these racial science. Mm-hmm. And so the I, the Jews are never going to be part of the Aryan race race or any of the higher more developed uh human races as they're so proclaimed to be well they're because they're seen as as anti or like pests or parasites which leads to right because the idea is that european nationalists in the 19th century start to view jews as sort of these infiltrative people right they they take heart to, they're, they're in charge of the finances and they're manipulating you know us good noble christian nationalists european peoples through their control of finances um, right, so it's not just that they're like not considered part of the quote unquote like higher race or higher races, but that they're almost like a like an enemy race, like an antithesis which, to which, themselves. To me, this has always been really interesting too, especially with the rise of the Nazi Party and how when, when they're dealing with German Jews at the beginning, I mean, the property is being confiscated and people are being sent to concentration camps for sure. But the Polish Jews are kicked out of Germany right away. So anyone who the Germans say are Polish Jews, they're not even allowed to stay. They're yeah. not, their properties, they're sent away. Well, and so this gets into more nitty gritty sort of Jewish history in Europe. Um, so Jews, right, because they've been excluded for centuries as well. I mean, massive changes is hap- are happening to the Jewish community in the 19th century as well, as with Poles and their nationalism. So lots of young Jews start to think, hey, maybe we should start to assimilate into the, these new European nations, these new European sort of sort of empires. What if we quit being religious and we tried to integrate ourselves? And so you see a massive kind of struggle within within the Jewish community in Europe about should we try to assimilate, should we not try to assimilate? 
This is also leads to the rise of Zionism, where some Jews say, well, maybe we should have our own nation just like everybody else is starting to develop, right? We should go back to the original Holy Land, which is then British Palestine, Palestine. and we should, you know, create our own state. So there's a lot of turmoil within the Jew Jewish community as well, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what they should do. Yeah, and I don't want to get too far yeah, too but, far afield, but, but, but it's the same thing is happening in, in Cuba, it's happening in Latin America, where um, immigrant Jews from early 20th century Europe are totally abandoning any sort of different language, different religion, and totally immersing themselves to a point where it, it becomes um, negligent. You know, you can't tell there's no difference at yeah. that point because they do a good job of really becoming part yeah. of the local yeah. culture. Yeah, exactly. And so this leads in the 19th century to intense antagonism on by the side of Polish nationalists to Jews, right? They see Jews as an enemy people. They see Jews as parasitic. They see Jews as sort of nefariously, you know, using their financial interests to like hurt the Poles. Right, so Jews easily become coded as the evil kind of other person who's damaging, you know, us noble martyred Poles. So after a new Polish nation is established, it's not that hard to get popular support for anti-Semitic laws to be passed. Right, so all the major Polish nationalists are definitely not usually pro-Polish. Some Jews are trying to assimilate into Polish society, but there's also another force that's on the rise: communism. Uh -huh. And so this is like it leads to a very contentious topic because. Well, because traditional anti-Semitism, particularly with the Nazis, says that, you know, Jews and Bolshevism or communism, as they would say, are like the same thing, right? right. That, that communism is a Jewish phenomenon. That's obviously not true. However, there is a large body of Jews that embrace communism, Absolutely. probably way out of proportion to like their size as, as an ethnic group. Which is uh, quite understandable considering they were excluded yeah. from the yeah. rest of society. And so this is because, and in in the explanation is... You know, there's no other ideology, there's no other state that's really willing to accept Jews. And also because many Jews are trying to leave Judaism, right? There's a movement among many Jews where they see Judaism as backward. They don't want to become Orthodox. They don't want to become nationalists, right? They're not Zionists. They don't necessarily want to like go establish a new state, but they're not being accepted by any of the new nations. So communism is a very enticing, very tempting universal ideology that says, you know, Race is not real. What really matters is class. We need to establish sort of this workers' universal global paradise. And and anywhere in Europe, and we you know we're talking about Poland, but this sort of applies to a lot of the unrest after World War One, where you have these communist movements rising up in Europe and in these fledgling democracies that are that are you know they have anarchists, they have yeah, communists, they have fascists. There's lots of different movements, people trying to rebuild the world after World War I. Yeah. And so in, in Poland, particularly after World War I, under the leadership of, of a guy, you know, Marshal Pilsudski, he's sort of considered the father of modern Poland. Um, you know, he's a Polish military officer, something of a socialist, but also something of a nationalist. Um, he actually maybe perhaps might be something of a fascist, but we usually don't think of him that way. Um, it's very easy then for Jews to be coded as not just the enemy, but as sympathies as sympathizers to communism, which is seen as as um, sort of a, the great enemy to a new independent Polish nation. So actually, in 1920, the Soviet Union invades Poland, um, right? The Soviet Union is going through a lot of civil wars. Um, the Soviet Union, they actually, the Soviet forces actually think that if they can try and spread the revolution in Europe, they can like kick off a, like a global revolution. And they actually try to link up and, and advance through Poland to go into Germany because the idea is that if we have a major communist revolution occur in industrialized Germany, that will cause all of Europe to become communist. There actually are like numerous little communist revolutions that occur in Germany, uprisings in different like various German like districts and counties and cities. And in 1920, the Soviets invade Poland and they get to the gates of Warsaw and they get repulsed. They get kicked out by the Poles. The Poles beat the Soviets. And this is seen by, you know, the Poles as like a, the greatness of the nation, yada, yada, yada. But it's also seen as, you know, evidence of the nasty evilness of the Soviet Union, which then very easily gets coded onto, you know, the Jews are out to destroy Poland. Right. And, and just uh, to, you know, be sure, too, Germany plays a large part in this. Yes. And the same sort of thing is happening in Germany where communist groups are being banned from doing demonstrations in what is a nominal democracy. And it's really, for all accounts, a democracy. Um, but, you know, 
communist demonstrators are being banned. Germany is very on uneven footing. It's it's reeling from the after-war effort. So we're talking very harsh times in the 1920s. People are are just struggling to get any food at all. Mass poverty there. So in in Germany and um, I think it's fair to say in in uh, Poland at the same time, Jews are not like public enemy number one. In fact, they're not. They, they're, there's a history of sort of anti-Semitism, but it's not on everyone's radar as it will be in like say later in the 1940s. Yeah, yeah but that's also though is because I mean the Nazi Party is one of those extremist parties that starts to say you know the real bad guy here is the Jews. Right, Jews become a very, as time goes on, become a, like a very easy scapegoat for the for people's problems. There's also the promulgation of the really infamous, you know, protocols of the elders of Zion, which claims that you know Jews are like have this evil conspiracy to destroy European societies and rule the world through finance. This also gets coded right with lots of financial turmoil. Um, this gets coded into maybe weird parallels to the nastiness of our own day, where anti-Semitism becomes seen as a kind of socialism. And indeed, I forget where the phrase exactly comes from, but I think in the late 19th century, um, um, an Austrian politician called anti-Semitism the socialism of fools. Because a lot of these nationalists would say the real thing that's holding back the unity and the economic growth and success and, you know, sort of workers' paradise of our nation is these evil Jews. And, and that's part of the... Once that line is drawn and these these heroic narratives are like resurrected by the people who come to power in these European states, the Jews are excluded. So when when Hitler is doing public works programs, he's taking from the Jews and he's giving to people he deems as German. So yeah. so Jews do not get the education, the public education. They don't get jobs. They don't get and it's a slow. He's slowly strangling the Jewish society, and they're encouraging Jews to leave. They're the Germans, what they do is is take Jewish money and then put them on a train to Poland or on a boat across the sea. Yeah, it's and so you see lots of German Jews do flee to Poland. Right. But also we need to take into account that there's a very large Pol Polish. Like, um, 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 very large Jewish population in Poland. Right. And this is because going back to sort of how we talked about how the land that would become the nation of Poland was divided up among various European empires. One of the major sections that would become Poland was under what was called the Russian Pale of Settlement. And the Pale of Settlement was basically a strip in Western, in the Western Russian Empire, which now comprises like Belarus, some of the Baltics, um, parts of Poland, you know, parts of Ukraine. It was this strip where the Russian Empire decreed that Jews could live. They couldn't live anywhere else without like very special circumstances. It was sort of like, okay, Jews, we promise that we won't interfere with you very much, but you also can only stay in this one section, basically making kind of a ghetto of a whole strip of the empire. So after um, you know the Russian Empire breaks up and Poland is established, a big chunk of the Pale of Settlement turns out to now be in the new Polish state. So Poland then has a big chunk of of a of a of a, of a Jewish population and also a very Orthodox Jewish population. Um, and this leads to a lot of tension, right? Where lots of Poles are like, "What are these Jews doing in our territory?" A lot of these Orthodox Jews don't necessarily want to assimilate. It creates a lot of tension immediately. And that's, again, that's that li line that is being drawn. And uh, we have, so you have people, and you have people on both sides in Germany and Poland, even in Soviet Union, you know, drawing lines to exclude these people, but they have to live somewhere. And they want to live somewhere. And, you know, so. Yeah. And also, and also just sort of, you know, resources become scarce with like economic fluctuations. It becomes very easy, as we've said, to, be, to turn the Jews into sort of enemy number one, scapegoat number one. It, and um, yeah, in fact, before, uh, so one of the most famous nights of, of when Jews are persecuted in Germany is Kristallnacht, Night of the Broken Glass. It actually starts in, in direct reaction to the German um, Polish Jewish tension because a, a man who's disenchanted with the way his family's assets have been taken goes into a German embassy and shoots. Um, uh, a Nazi, uh, Nazi uh, uh, member of the dip diplomacy or whatever. Anyway, that 
that shooting, murdering a Nazi, and this is after the Nazis have been in power for a few years, gives the Nazis enough power to say, these people are enemy of the state. You can now... But that occurs in Poland, right? The shooting, I think, doesn't it? No, no, no. I, it was right on the borderlands, right? The right? Border. But, but it, it occurs because the Polish Jews in Germany were being deported. Yeah. Um, and, and again, so this is a very blurry line, what's declared Polish, what's, you know... Yeah, this and so... And so it gets nasty. Um, and so let's kind of fast forward a little bit to actually, you know, what happens in World War II. Because um, probably of almost any territory in the war, Poland suffers the most. Um, it's occupied. Anyway, there's the infamous, you know, um, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact that's, that is brokered in 19, I believe, 1939 yeah. between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, right? They're, they're two major enemies, right? Eventually, you know, Nazi Germany will invade the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union will result in a brutal, brutal war, right? And they both have really nasty propaganda against each other. They're considered, like, you know, they're each other are each other's number one enemy. But the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact says, you know, we are willing to, to um, sort of lay our differences aside in that we both will agree to divide up Poland. Because the thing is, Poland is a sore, basically, in the side of both the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Both of them don't like Poland. Both of them think Poland is sort of geopolitically, you know, kind of a threat. It's kind of a problem. They want to neutralize it. Yeah. And also, both of them, remember, have, en have remembrances, oftentimes in the lives of lots of people, when there was no Poland, and when Poland was under Russian and Poland was under German um, control, and those lands were considered just part of Russia and part of po a part of uh, Germany, or part of Russia and part of Germany, and so they make a pact that, that says we will sort of mutually invade Poland and carve it up between each other. And, and so this is what kicks off World War II is the Nazi invasion of Poland, but um, the Soviet Union invaded Poland, I believe, a couple weeks later. Yeah, and, and just to nail down some of these dates to get it specific, and also to place uh, where the Jews are in all of this, so uh, Kristallnachter, the Night of the Broken Glass, is in 1938, so the Germans had been persecuting the Jews for a while, and 1939 is a year of a lot of Jews leaving Germany, the ones who have the means yeah. sort of get out. They go to South America, they go to Africa, they go to Israel or uh, Palestine oh, yeah, at the time. Like Israel British won't exist Still for not ten, more years, 10 more years. British mandated Palestine. And um, and then the Nazi Soviet non-aggression pact is August 23rd, 1939, and two weeks later, September 1st, 1939. Yeah. And this is kind of the date of World War II. Yeah, started. that's when officially it's sort of considered by most history books as September 1st, 1939. So you're right, the Poles, right, they, they suddenly find their state being carved up, and right, and their army just gets pummeled, right? Because they're trying to fight a two-front war between two very nasty Militaries, and you hear these absurd stories of people will initially flee to the Nazis to escape the Soviets, thinking the Nazis will be better than the Soviets, or you hear some people fleeing to the Soviets, thinking the Soviets will be better than the Nazis. It's a very nasty situation. And, and the Nazis right away, of course, uh, see the Poles as, you know, this government of failure because they've allowed Jews to stay in Poland. And um, so what the Nazis are going to do, like they do when they invade, is they're going to tear apart the Polish uh, political structure. They're going to build their own structure yeah. and sort of put in their uh, own laws at the time. Yeah. So, so at least o over a million Poles are are put into Germany at this point as, as slave yeah. laborers. Yeah. So, so yeah. a massive chunk of what was then um, Western Poland is now considered part of, of, of Nazi Germany. The Soviet Union claims a big chunk of, of Eastern Poland and claims it's part of the Soviet Union. And yet both of them, not just the Nazis, but also the Soviets, began to sort of do massive basically social restructuring. So thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Poles are deported, basically. They're ethnically cleansed um, from what was then um, Eastern Poland by the Soviet Union. They're sent off to Siberia, to Central Asia. Lots of people are rounded up and shot, right? They start to build collective farms. And then in, on, the, on the Nazi side, right, they set up the general government, which is sort of considered like a protectorate, like a, set, like a state within a state within Poland under Nazi rule. And at this point in the German, in the Nazi world, the the status of a Polish Jew is so low that you can you can murder a Polish Jew, you can take everything they have, and you're not going to face consequences for yeah, it. Yeah, no. And so 
you know, the Nazis are very anti-Polish, but particularly, yeah, as you said, um, anti-Polish Jew or just Jews in general. But particularly in Poland, they consider sort of the Jews that live in Poland to be like the worst of the worst. And this is where the Polish law wants it. The Polish law says, talk about this. This yeah. is the Holocaust. Well, and but the, <laughs> the problem is what's also or what makes it complicated is that if you're a Jew, what do you do? You hear the cases of thousands of Jews fleeing um, across Poland to get to Soviet-occupied Poland. Because the Jews know that, at least for the Poles, it kind of sucks both ways, right? right. Nazis, Soviets, you know, who, how do I want to get killed, you know? Yeah. But if you're a Jew, you at least have the guarantee that the Soviets aren't going to kill you. They're, they, you know, they're not going to be nice to you, but they're not set at setting out to, like, make your life completely miserable. And this is still about a year before the Holocaust really begins, when the industrial scale shooting and killing begins. But even Jews at this point know that... The Soviets are going to treat you a little bit better than the Nazis, right? Right. right. And so you, this also is something that becomes a sticking point for many Poles and in Polish history of World War II, is the sense among lots of Poles that the Jews supported the Soviet Union and that they even celebrated the Soviet Union advancing into Poland. It's very politically contentious, right? Where Poles will claim, you Jews were for the Soviet Union, you weren't loyal to Poland. And that becomes a major sticking point. And also then, of course, it's no surprise, though, that Jews would support the Soviet Union at this moment because at least they're not going to kill them. And you think of them as any rational actor. And then Poland goes much the way of of Germany under the Nazis. People see who's in power and who's moving up, and and they turn. And one of the forces uh, that the Nazis use to great effect is the Polish police, a force of over 20,000 people called the Blue Police, who are basically upholding now the the wishes of the yeah. Nazi party. Yeah, and so it becomes very contentious. We actually have many multiple moving sort of parts here with, with the history of the war. And Poland is maybe more complicated than, than almost any other country, right? So you have some Polish nationalists who say, wait a second, the Nazis are kind of doing what we kind of want to see. They're getting rid of Jews. They're instituting certain like, you know, you know, nationalistic laws. Maybe they're not so bad. Maybe we should work with them. Right. Maybe we should work with them to try and kind of preserve what we can of Poland. You know, so there is a lot of collaboration. On the other side, you also have um, basically what's called the general government of Poland, which becomes the sort of the official government in exile, which flees to London, flees to flees to Great Britain. They institute a government in exile and they sort of institute what becomes known as the home army, which becomes sort of a hyper nationalistic Polish underground resistance um, army which fights against both the Nazis and the Soviets trying to create an independent Poland. And and those blue police that I just mentioned, the 20,000 strong who some of them are, you know, are killing Jew Polish Jews, they are also part of this underground resistance yeah. movement. They want an independent Poland too even though they're working with the Nazis. Yeah, and so you find there's certain areas of Poland that end up getting occupied um, like four or five times during World War 1 because they get invaded by the Soviets. They, then they get invaded by the Nazis, and then they get invaded by the Soviets again. And so you have, right, Nazis killing killing communists, Nazis killing Jews. You have the home army killing communists and Nazis. Um, and then you also have the home army killing Jews, because the home army is very nationalist. They are not particularly nice to Jews either, because many of these people in this underground home army, who are roundly considered heroes by not just many Poles, but like many like historians. It's like, look at these like noble, heroic Poles who are fighting in the underground against both the Nazis and the Soviets for their own independent state. Also, right, they're they're hyper-nationalists. They're not friendly to Jews. And this is, I just want to step away from the narrative for just a second. This is why, this is why a nuanced view of history that is so important because you can't, it's so impossible to just say, this group was good, this yeah, group was it's, bad. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it becomes very morally blurry. And also you have Polish communists who are also fighting against the Nazis, but who are hoping for a return of the Soviets to establish a Polish communist state. And then you also have sort of Jews who are trapped in ghettos in the major cities. They're being rounded up and put into camps, um, right? It's a very nasty situation. Everyone is sort of antagonistic to everybody else. Not, and, not to mention the Polish abroad, so Polish American. Yeah. You have Poles all over the world. Yeah, and so it's a very, very <sighs> nasty situation. And then, of course, um, the Nazis build not the majority, but I think of probably of any territory that has the highest concentration of, of oh, well, highest concentration of concentration camps and death camps, they build them in Poland. 
Right. And so, like, not just Auschwitz, but, like, Treblinka, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, I think. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. many, many, many of these, of these, of these horror camps are created, um, you know, the concentration camps and death camps are created and in, in instituted in Poland. This, though, leads to where, I think, the crux of where this gets really controversial. We have definitive proof that some Poles did collaborate with the Nazis in the Holocaust. We know this from numerous first-hand accounts. We have accounts that even if they didn't necessarily collaborate firsthand, it's not like they were in the camp, you know, throwing Jews into, into the gas chamber. They would, you know, after, say, Jews would round up, Poles would raid Jewish homes. Mm-hmm. Jew, the, um, Poles would rob Jews because they would say, well, you're going to get killed soon anyway, so I don't care about stealing your stuff. Um, we know that some some Poles would sort of independently commit pogroms against Jewish communities in advance of even the Nazis showing up. And this actually became a very contentious in the last 10 years or so. Um, a Polish historian, um, Jan Gross, he, he was very famous. He was a big deal in Poland because he wrote a history of sort of the Polish resistance. He wrote a history of the Soviet invasion of Poland. He was seen, you know, as writing sort of like about, you know, this Polish history that people don't really talk about. But then he took a much more controversial turn with his publication of this book called Neighbors in 2000 that, that documented the destruction of a Jewish community in a small town in what was called, I might butcher the, the Polish, in Jedwabne, Poland, where basically the neighbors and the surrounding Polish um, community came together for a pogrom and wiped out about a thousand Jews in this little town in Poland. And this is this really this book highlights the importance of of history and and the conversations that history creates yeah. and the sort of need for a historian to be able to publish yeah. Uh, an argument. Yeah, and so he got into a lot of trouble um, with the Polish government. It was very controversial, but I think it's also controversial because at the same time that some Poles are killing Jews, Nazis are also killing Poles. Um, Poles are really heavily hit by the Nazi occupation. About three million, I think, approximately yeah. Poles. Um, die as a result of World War One. Either they get shot, they get beaten, they die of starvation, disease, right? But that's a lot. That's a lot of people. Three million people is a lot of people. It is, and you and um, um, to be clear, like this, these are people, both poles who are Christians and and poles who are Jews, especially Jewish poles, are just living in in a hellscape. Like yeah. there, there's death all around. The economy is nothing. They don't know. There's no certainty yeah. in life. Yeah, it's it's very very nasty, and so also you have the home the home army, which is trying to do these certain uprisings. Um, it's a very nasty situation, and this leads to kind of the moral claim that you will find after the war is some people will claim, yeah, well the Jews suffered, but we too suffered, and we we can sort of save that for a few minutes later. But that's important to realize is that you know poles are also being killed in camps; they're also being you know starved to death. It's not necessarily as if Jews are the only ones being the subject of Nazi persecution and, you know, Nazi sort of death squads at this time. Poles, their value in this Nazi system is incredibly low. So, however, right by the end of the war, near the end, 1944, the Nazi Germany is definitively on the retreat. They're moving out of Poland. The Soviets are starting to come across Poland. What happens is really controversial. As the Soviets start to move across um, Poland, what do they do? Not just do they kill Nazis, they also start to kill nationalist Poles. And they start to kill members of the Polish Home Army because the Soviets consider the Polish Home Army to be hostile to the Soviets. And this this goes back to the unrest of the 1920s when people and political parties are jou- you know jostling for for power, they're jostling for roles. No one's forgotten that. These are a lot of them the same people who have, yeah. who have fought and who have lost family members to yeah. these causes. And so before. and so think about like it's like and it's just the craziness of the situation, right? Where it's occupation, occupation, occupation you know, fighting among four or five different groups. It's really, it's, it's crazy. So as, and so for many Poles, right, this is like horrific that they're seeing, you know, kind of like their resistance force that was fighting the Nazis for years now being killed by the Soviets. So the Soviets are not just killing Nazis as they move through Poland, they're also killing members of this home army. And in a very infamous incident in 1944, um, there is the Warsaw Uprising. And it's a very major um, um, event where the home army sort of mobilizes the resistance in the city. They say the time has come to rise up and try and get rid of the Nazis and and definitively liberate the city, basically. So there's an uprising in Warsaw in 1944. The Soviet army at this time is camped right across a river, right? Warsaw sits on a river. 
Um, the Soviets are camped out. They've advanced really far. They're camped out on a river just right across from the city. The problem is, as the Warsaw Uprising continues, the home army um, becomes weakened. They become defeated. The Nazis call in some of the nastiest of the nasty you know, military units they have and basically say, you have permission to destroy the city and kill every, everything you see. Destroy Warsaw, basically. Do not, do not let anybody out alive. And so while the home army is engaged in this fight to the death with the Nazis, what is the Soviet army doing? Nothing. They sit across the river. Even though if the Soviets had come to the aid of the home army, they could have helped the home army definitively defeat the Nazis in Warsaw and even prevent the destruction of the city. And, and this is one of those really interesting things about the high political actors yeah. because Churchill and the United Kingdom had played host to the home army and the United Kingdom really wanted to support them and they saw this as the good fight. They're fighting yeah. the Nazis. These are our people. And they pleaded with the United States and they pleaded with FDR and they pleaded with uh, any Stalin. of the allies. Yeah. They pleaded with Stalin, do something. This is Poland's chance to beat the Nazis. But everyone was always politically calculating yeah. in their own geopolitical And, and a lot of people think that what it, what Stalin did is he said, you know, let just let them kill each other. Basically, because the whole plan, right, is that the Soviets want to take power in Poland after the war is over. So why help these people, these, these sort of Polish nationalists in the home army who are going to be your enemies after the war? So that's, we think that's sort of what Stalin planned to do. And so the Soviet army basically just sits across the river and watches the home army fight to the death and then once, you know, the battle is over and Warsaw is like burned Gone. to the ground, yeah. then the Soviet military advances across the river. Again, something that lots of Poles remember to this day with very, very burning passion. And one of Stalin's giant towers still sits yeah. in Warsaw, looming yeah. over Poland. Yeah, and so <laughs> after the war, right, everything's really brutal. Millions of people are dead. And so then communism comes to power in Poland. Um, but we should also keep in mind is that this, then the majority of the death camps and the concentration camps are liberated by Soviet troops. I think that's important to mention. They're not liberated by Americans. Right. They're and, liberated and by Soviet troops. And there's a lot of uh, – this is a hotly debated issue, especially in people among people who studied the Holocaust. It's sort of like what was the reaction? You know, How early did we know about these death yeah. camps? Why didn't we bomb rail yeah, lines? Yeah, and yeah. so there's a lot of debate about yeah. this. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's nasty. Yeah. But So we know that then right, communism comes to power. It's a client state under the Soviet Union in Poland. Poland, basically, its whole borders get shifted. It gets shifted – um, westward, so big chunks of what were Eastern Germany become Western Poland, and sort of a new new areas are carved into the Soviet Union and what was formerly Poland. So Poles are understandably a little aggrieved from the war where they've lost like three million people. They feel like they've been betrayed by the United States, by the United Kingdom. They feel especially antagonistic to the Soviet Union for basically they think selling out the home army. Um, they've lost like a lot of territory and a lot of their populations are over in what's now the Soviet, like, Soviet Union proper. And this then leads to the contention that's still popular among Polish nationalists is the idea that the Jews celebrate the coming of the Soviet Union, right? They think that the argument is, you know, the Soviets, as they move through through the country, the surviving Jews celebrate the coming of communism in the Soviet Union. How dare they, these evil Soviets, Right. How dare the Jews celebrate these people who are enemies of the Polish nation? And we're talking a much, much smaller population because largely the Jews, the Jews have, been killed. have been killed. And then there's also, right, lots of Jews are members of the political, the Communist Party. So you see lots of Jews from, from the Soviet Union come into Poland to basically start running the country. It becomes very contentious. And then, of course, there's also all these like Polish collaborators, you know, like, Pol like Polish peasants, you know, who might have helped kill a few Jews or two when they could, people that stole property from Jews, right, who are still all mixed up in this. And 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 that becomes another part of the, uh, th these un instabilities after wars cannot be overstated. Yeah. Finding out whose was what and who was who. Yeah. And But I think also the problem, I think it's hard for Americans to understand, is that after World War II, the Holocaust never becomes basically a codified historical event the way it does become in the United States. And and part of that is because the United States, A, has a large Jewish population, yes. and B, had a lot of Jews come during yes. the war. So, so the, yeah, so basically after the war, if you had survived um, the Holocaust in, in Europe, you went two places. You went to British Palestine to join the Zionist cause, right. or you went to America. Mm -hmm. So America, right, has the biggest Jewish population outside of Israel. 
Lots of Jews remember the horrible treatment and genocide. And so that helps lead to a kind of the Holocaust becoming kind of coded as a major historical event within kind of the broad popular consciousness, more than like any other major historical event probably in 20th century Europe. Americans know about the Holocaust. Under the Soviets and under the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, they never teach the Holocaust. They never, the Soviet Union officially never recognizes that there was a specific genocide of Jews. They never deny that Jews were killed. They never say, oh, there was no genocide. They characterize it as part of the massacre of Soviet citizens or Soviet, you know, or innocent peoples by the Nazis. They basically sort of group the Holocaust as a specific genocide in with the broader killings of civilians by the Nazis. And so this means then that there's no sense within Soviet education, within communist education, in the very places in the world where the Holocaust took place, that there was such a thing as a specific genocide of Jews. It becomes kind of a taboo topic. There's a sort of low-level institutionalized anti-Semitism against Jews in the Soviet Union, starting in the late 40s and through the 50s. But so the understanding of the Holocaust in Europe is just totally different than it is here in the United States. It never becomes seen as like, as a thing. And not to mention, one of the interesting things, too, about the Jews who make it to the United States is quite a few Jews who make it to the United States are actually German Jews and highly educated German Jews who are getting out of Europe before Europe turns to, like, death camp Holocaust Europe. So they have knowledge of the atrocities that are happening, certainly, because they're writing to people back home and they're in touch with people who are, have to live through it. And of course, when the war ends, they go to look and find, you know, is my is my mother still there? And, and they can't find these people. So those people try to uncover the facts. But at the same time, a lot of the Polish Jews were killed. They didn't make it yeah. out. So, so in those areas, as you go farther Eastern Europe, there's less connections with the past that happened there as compared to yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of information. Yeah, from there's the le- yeah, there's less investigation of what happens, and also I think importantly for sort of Polish Israeli relations, lots of Eastern European Jews after the war do tend to go towards Israel. Um, this is also because there's there's lots of Poland was actually kind of the major hub of, of Zionism prior to World War II, so most of the surviving Jews from Poland do end up going to Israel. So in Israel. Lots of the, you know, that first kind of wave of survivors of the Holocaust are very, to say the least, anti-Polish. Right. Because they remember their treatment. They remember, like, hey, Poland, why didn't you help us? Why did some of you help in killing us? And so it's kind of, though, remains kind of frozen in Europe. The issue of the Holocaust in Europe and within these countries becomes kind of frozen under communism. Mm -hmm. So... It's only after the Cold War ends and the communism collapses that these issues start to really heat up again. Mm -hmm. Because then, right, people from America and people from Israel, Jews from America, Jews from Israel, can start traveling to these countries that they couldn't go to before, right? Basically, right after World War II, these countries where the Holocaust happened were closed off. You Mm -hmm. could not get to them. And you couldn't also, as historians, get to the archives. Right, as right. Churchill said, an iron curtain yeah, descended yeah. And across so, Europe. And so, you know, access to really understanding what happened um, was was frozen for decades. So it's only after um, the end of the Cold War that people start to go to these places. They start to really go through the archives, and it's really when people are like, "Oh, you know, many, many, many Polish civilians." I won't want to say necessarily complicit, but they weren't like heroic in their actions in the Holocaust. This is not to denigrate that there were many, I should also say many, Poles who did shelter Jews. Right. right? We don't want to characterize all Poles as one way or the other. It's just that, right, it's it's important to realize that many Poles did help save Jews, but also many Poles were indifferent or many Poles were also active in the killing of Jews. And this is why, um, this is sort of the value of history here and, and sort of it really devalues the notion that any one people is above committing atrocity and any one people is has a clean record yeah. because there are good and bad people from every nation. Yeah. There's good and bad people from every culture. So the problem with this with this Polish law is is that it's saying because we are who we are so you know yeah. because Poland is a great country we we didn't do that yeah kind we, of we thing. could never be involved in that and so, yeah and so that becomes why it's so contentious now um, because we're still trying to reckon with the legacy of the Holocaust is n- nationalist Poles to this day do not want to ever confront or admit that there was any complicity by any Poles ever in the killing of Jews during World War II and on the flip side right in Israel, 
there is definitely right a sort of almost like cult of Holocaust remembrance that says, you know, Israel has to exist to prevent the next Holocaust, right? Menachem Begin, when when Israel invades on southern Lebanon in the early 80s, says, you know, he's doing this to prevent another Treblinka from occurring, right? And so it's, it's sort of like two extreme visions. On one side in Poland, the nationalists do not want to recognize the Holocaust and their role in it ever or any role of any poll. And then on basically the, the right-wing nationalist side in Israel, they don't want to recognize anything but um, com- <laughs> complicity on the part of, of certain poles in the Holocaust. And this also gets into an, a, an important discussion, and it's going to be under review. Like, this has been put into law, signed into law, but it, like the United States, it'll have to go under judicial review, and it will be reviewed for the constitutionality because, well, a human right is freedom of speech. And one of the things historians rely on is the ability to be critical of anyone. So we, we look at the documents that we have and we try to understand the past and that means that you take the documents and you say what the documents tell or at least to the best of your ability and we try to correct for it and say errors there might be in the documents but if you're not protected by free speech to criticize anyone then you're not you're not really able to write a good history. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why this one historian I mentioned earlier, Jan Gross, who wrote about um, sort of a Polish pogrom during World War II in, in Yedvavna. It's also why um, he, I, I think he's been accused of slander by the Polish government or like maligning, right? He's been accused of something. And he also wrote another book. And this is also something that's contentious in Poland. Is there's also major anti-Semitism against Jews in Poland after the war. Because any surviving Jews, you know, tried to go back to their homes after the Holocaust. And guess what? Oftentimes they would find Poles living in their homes. Right, because they would have taken their property, they confiscated it. You know, they thought the Jews had been killed, so no one would care if they took their property. And you hear of these really tragic circumstances um, where actually some Poles will end up killing people who survived the Holocaust when these Jews come back to their homes to claim their property because these Poles do not want to give up. Um, basically the homes that they've taken over from Jews. And this is like one of those... And that's another subject of Jan, uh, another book by Jan Gross. It's called Fear, like anti-Semitism in Poland after Auschwitz or something. And this gets back to sort of that question I asked in the beginning of when does history start? Because one one sort of issue that we have anytime there's a regime change or anytime there's a change of, uh, of sort of, you know, who's in charge and who controls the property people are always going to come back and say, you know, well, this is the village that I, this is the town, this is the city that I grew up in. How can you say this is not my house anymore because there was a new government? And so these kind of things happen throughout all regime changes and and it creates a real contentious issue. Um, in, in terms of... Uh, of slander, there's also that uh, film that just recently came out that's about the Holocaust denial, um, called uh, Denial. <laughs> oh yeah, the one about um, Deborah Lipstadt, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and this is an American case about uh, being sued for slander. It's David in, Irving. Yeah. Uh huh. In, in Britain, so this is not a new thing that's happening in, in Poland. It yeah. is kind of strange to see a government institutionalized. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to note though that this isn't. I don't. I, I would hesitate to call this new Polish law an example of Holocaust denial. It's not like the Polish government is saying the Holocaust didn't happen. Right. They told like th- no one's thinking that. Like they like it's not. That's not the issue. It's almost a weird sense of like denying certain incidents of the Holocaust and saying like the Holocaust happened totally, but Poles were not part of it. Right. <laughs> Even though contrary to the evidence. Some Poles were part of it. Some Poles did take advantage of the Holocaust. Some Poles did kill Jews. Some Poles did collaborate with the Nazis. Which, which this, and this is again a fundamental problem that nationalists seem to always have to come to terms with is when you're creating a nationalist narrative, nationalists don't tend to say they've ever done anything wrong. Yeah, and I think also, and this is also something that's important to reckon in Eastern Europe, especially when you talk about the nature, like the Holocaust is that many, many, many Eastern European peoples will be like, well, that sucks about the Jews, but guess what? Millions of my people were killed too. For instance, like in Russia, like what is in the Soviet Union, I shouldn't say, they're not the same thing, but like Soviet Union, like what? It's like approximately 20 million people die during the war. Yeah. Um, probably in terms of just Russian, ethnic Russians, it's probably like half that. So that's like what? Like that's like five or more, five to 10 million Russians get killed in World War II. So I know that particularly a lot of, some Russians I've met are sort of, 
there's a kind of indifference, perhaps you could say, in certain areas in Eastern Europe, because it's just like, well, everybody got killed by the Nazis in World War II. Everybody, everybody had a hard time. They would just say, like, well, yeah, it sucks about the Jews, but like, you know, tens of millions of these other people died, or all these Russians died, or Poles. Right? Poles can just say ethnic Poles will say, well, hey, three million Poles were killed. You know, so like, why does no one talk about them? Why do you know? And, and so this becomes really contentious. It's kind of like the politics of memory and commemoration. Right? Yeah, and this is also one of the. Um, I was very lucky to visit with James actually the war museum in Russia, and to them, it's a, it's something to be celebrated that the Nazis were defeated. That's number one. Why talk about? The, Jews dying yeah, when we yeah, could yeah. talk about how great we are. Yeah, and I think it's also right. So then everybody wants to claim their own suffering during World War II. Everybody wants to claim their own sort of victory in the war. And the Jews become sort of problematic to all of those narratives, right? Because Israel can't claim as a national state that World War II was a triumph, right? No. Like yeah. in the way that, say, Russia or Russia can and the way that, say, other states can, the way that maybe, you know... You're right. And so it becomes really contentious about, you know, you start playing these roles of like who gets to claim what legacy of the war. But this is also contentious to this very day, right, in politics, say, in like Ukraine and the Baltics between those states and Russia, because many Ukrainian nationalists and many nationalists in general in a lot of these where now Eastern European states did collaborate with the Nazis to some degree in Ukraine. Lots of hardcore Ukrainian nationalists during World War II collaborated because they saw the Nazis as freeing them from the Soviet yoke and like helping them to establish an independent state under like Nazi sort of tutelage. Also, they didn't like Jews too, so it's like you know why cry over spilled milk or something? You know, if the if the if Nazis can help us get an independent state, get rid of the Soviets, and if they want to kill the Jews, whatever. In the Baltics, you see the same thing, like in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. You know. Um, Many of these, of these so-called kind of forest brothers, partisans who sort of escape into the woods and who fight the Soviets even after um, the Soviets um, take over the Baltics after World War II. They fight until like the mid-50s, right? They, they're now known and seen as kind of like nationalist heroes within the Baltic states. Many of those same people were allied with the Nazis or were like subunits, you know, or like, right? They were like partisan units under the control of the Nazis during World War II. And so you have this weird and very tumultuous legacy where many Eastern European states that were persecuted very viciously by the Soviets claim part of their proud nationalist heritage as people who fought against the Soviets during World War II. Incidentally, those forces were kind of sympathetic to the Nazis at the least, and some of them did help kill Jews. Right. And so all, all said and told what makes this uh, law so interesting to follow and the reason why we talk this and the whole purpose Matthias and I study history and the reason we talk about history is to add these sort of nuance to the discussion to just so people can't use yeah. this as force again because this is sort of what created the problems of the Holocaust yeah. just by painting people as one thing and that's who they are. Yeah. And so I think the problem here is that Poland, it's a, it should not have passed the law. I think at the same time, it's also Israel, perhaps, I don't know, maybe I feel bad criticizing it, but Israel perhaps should also not paint all Poles as, you know, evil Holocaust collaborators. And and uh, I've never been to Israel. Poland is a beautiful country, and the people in Poland are fantastic. Yeah. I'm sure we would say the same thing if we went to Israel. I mean, I'd like to go see Tel Aviv sometime. Oh, of course. See I the, hear Tel Aviv is fantastic. We should end on a positive note. I know, right? I know. But so I think it's with this law is right now, I think, in a very extreme example of very contentious understandings, very nasty events that are being hijacked. I should not want to say hijacked, but they're being the interpretation of these events are being now sort of led by nationalists of all kinds who have a very particular agenda when it comes to understanding historical events to make themselves look good. So this law is, is I think, sort of scary because it might portend further radicalization of Polish nationalism towards the extreme right. Um, in Europe, and that's a little frightening. Right. So keep asking questions. Keep listening to great podcasts like Hour of History. <laughs> Make sure uh, you subscribe best on Google Play. <laughs> We're on iTunes. We're on YouTube. Yeah. Subscribe. And uh, thanks for joining us. We'll, we'll have sunnier topics in the future, but these are important. Yes. And as a side note, if you're interested in learning more about these topics, please read the historian Jan Gross. Thank you. And that title is Neighbors. Jan Gross wrote Neighbors, and he's written other works, of yes. course. 
All right, thank you so much, and thanks for listening to the Hour of History.